Hello, and welcome to our Uncanny Valley. Here we hope to present to you a mingling of fiction, dramatized stories, and factual dives on all manner of mysteries, from the real world to the deepest corners of the internet, without getting too heavy. Just a good, safe, spooky space to come and chill. My name is Hollis, and I am still not haunted. Our content is researched and written by N.L. McFarland, the Gomez to my neon fever dreamwave Morticia. Information will be in the description box for all relevant sources and social media. And please do the usual YouTube things as you desire. For our first video, it felt appropriate to start with the uncanny valley itself that slippery slope where something is just too human to be all right. Though such a popular concept now that it is virtually a household word, the uncanny valley has been with us since the dawn of humanity, though perhaps not so specifically named. From the time humans first looked at something and thought, mm, they don't look quite right. I don't like that. Mind you, this is not the same concept as simple discrimination, the recognition that something is different. Not the negative current term discrimination that so often immediately springs to mind. This is more of a reflection on how you can tell one thing from another. Very basic definition. There you are, simply discriminating between things, noticing how they are different, even if they are similar. Now step further, you're seeing something similar to a human, perhaps a doll or a video you're watching. Here you find a visceral gut reaction, an aversion to some perceived wrongness. That isn't right, that isn't human, and you don't like it. A face of a mask in the dark, a CGI generated person, or an actor you know to be dead looking back at you from a brand new movie. Corpses themselves could also reside in the uncanny valley as something we naturally want to avoid and isn't quite human any longer. This is also a portion of the concept of why clowns are such a common fear. They appear to be human, but the exaggerated features are not quite human enough. And it is very, very <laughs> unsettling for a lot of people. Finding yourself in the uncanny valley is not simply that perceived difference, that discriminating eye, but also the negative reaction to that difference. This reaction can range from a mere uneasiness to absolute revulsion, and thus is the valley, the drop in positive feelings toward the subject. Humans are naturally social creatures, and it is hardwired into our genetic makeup to respond positively to other humans or human-like appearances. We see faces where there are none, the effect known as pareidolia. Babies from birth respond to faces or face-like toys more positively. And as inanimate objects appear more human, we tend to like them more. To a point. The hypothesis itself was put forth by robotics professor Masahiro Mori in his 1970 book, Bikimi no Tani, where he labeled it Bikimi no Tani Gensho or the uncanny valley phenomenon, though this has also been translated as valley of eeriness phenomenon. He hypothesized that as the appearance of a robot is made more human, it's generally perceived more positively and with more empathy, until a point is reached where a sudden negative reaction occurs. Movement amplifies the emotional response, and when these reactions are plotted on a graph, a deep trough or a valley was observed. While initially applied to robots, the hypothesis predicts that anything appearing almost human has a risk of negative reactions in the viewer. This can include dolls, models, statues, and computer-generated models and images. Certain movies spring to mind that tried a little too hard to be realistic and absolutely bombed in the box office because they just came off it downright creepy. Our foray into virtual and augmented reality and pushing the boundaries of photorealistic computer animations has definitely expanded the concept exponentially. Bikimi no Tani was literally translated as Uncanny Valley rather than Valley of Eeriness in the 1978 book Robots, Fact, Fiction, and Prediction by Josia Reichardt. 
Reichardt is a fascinating person in her own right, an art critic and curator, teacher, and prolific writer who specializes in the emergence of computer art. Way back in 1968, she curated the Cybernetic Serendipity Exhibition at London's Institute of the Contemporary Arts. She continues to write and lecture on the relationship of art to technology and has written books on art, computers, robots, and the future. I would be very interested to know her thoughts on the rise of AI art, but that is a completely different topic. Sort of. It does generate a lot of uncanny shit. <laughs> the uncanny valley concept was developed in regard to robots by those who were invested in positive robot and human interactions, disseminated through the emerging genre of computer art. However, it has deeper connections, and now from robotics and art, we travel down the path of psychology. Through Reichardt's use of the word uncanny rather than eerie, the unintentional link was made to the psychoanalytic concept of the uncanny. First put forward by Ernst Gensch in his 1906 essay, it was later disseminated by none other than Sigmund Freud. In psychology, the uncanny is the experience of something frightening in a way that feels oddly familiar, such as mundane things in eerie or taboo contexts. It's a product of intellectual uncertainty, and for Freud, the uncanny is located in the strangeness of the ordinary. We can see another example like this with liminal spaces, such as the back rooms, playgrounds at night, things that are very, very familiar, but the setting is not quite right and is strange, but ordinary. Both Freud and Gensch speak on the works of writer E.T.A. Hoffman who Freud referred to as the unrivaled master of the uncanny in literature. So there you go. A uh, reading recommendation for all you fans of gothic horror. Might be kind of interesting to follow up on. Jacques Lacan, another psychoanalyst, wrote that the uncanny feeling places us in the field where we do not know how to distinguish bad and good, pleasure from displeasure, and thus produces anxiety. His theories were later built upon by Sadek Rahimi, and he places a great deal of emphasis on the uncanny being tied to visual tropes and the idea that it doubles the ego, citing examples such as doppelgangers, ghosts, the feeling of deja vu, alter ego, self-alienation, split personhoods, phantoms, twins, and living dolls. Further still, we wander back to philosophy, where F.W.J. Schelling put forth that clarity was built upon the repression of the uncanny in 1837. Schelling was a German philosopher from the midpoint of German idealism who built upon the work of Greek philosophers. As a fascinating tangent, it was Schelling who first used the word unconsciousness. So let's dive yet a little bit deeper. What could cause this revulsion to something almost but not quite human, especially knowing that us humans tend to like things that appear that way? The first concept is mate selection. One may find something uncanny because it doesn't fit into their notion that this would be a good reproductive partner. Over time, humans have evolved assumptions that certain traits are predictive of low fertility, poor hormonal health, or inadequate immune systems. Seeing something not quite human subconsciously tells you this is not good for breeding. Stay away. Pathogen avoidance. Similarly, humans have a subconscious drive for self-preservation. Something which doesn't look quite right clearly has a defect, and that defect may be harmful to me. Things that look human are more likely to pass diseases, and this can go for uh, corpses wanting to avoid a corpse because a disease can be passed on. Identity and mortality. Are we going to be replaced by robots? Are we all just soulless machines? And what does it mean to be alive? And other shit I ask myself in my car as I drive home from my day job. By linking the human with the non-human, our sense of identity is undermined and the challenges to identity are never a very comfortable feeling. This is especially true if we feel threatened as if our unique humanity might be stripped away. Violation of human norms. 
When a doll or a robot strolls itself into the uncanny valley and throws itself right off that edge, no longer do we judge it to be a doll or robot playing at being human, but instead we attempt to judge it as a human doing a really terrible job at being quote unquote normal. We can like and appreciate something attempting to be human. That's cute. We like that. But if something is actually a human being, then why doesn't it sound or move like one that comes across as creepy? Conflicting perceptual cues. These theories bring up the difficulty and psychological discomfort or eeriness derived from being unable to categorize something. It's quite a current debate involving such big words as categorization difficulty, configural processing, perceptual mismatch, frequency-based sensitization, and inhibitory devaluation. Uh, you can look those up if you're interested in them, but I certainly took long enough to try and read them off. So robots or CGI-generated people kind of confuse us as to why we can't categorize them as human or non-human. Obviously, everyone is different and reacts to things differently. With so many billion possible reactions, clearly that uncanny valley creep isn't one easy to pin down feeling with one specific cause. It doesn't even need to be derived from the same sense. Some put emphasis on the visual, but sounds can be just as instrumental. In time, our uncanny valley may diminish or fade away entirely. As new generations are born with more exposure to robotics, computer-generated images, and technology we probably can't even dream of, the effect could become nothing more than a generational oddity. In time, humans could redefine their identity in a way that changes these perceptions away from the eerie. Whatever happens, we're just going to enjoy our creepy uncanny valley for as long as it's here, and we hope that you join us. Oh,